Hello and welcome to yet another instalment of our Nucleus Wealth Insight Series. Just a quick reminder that the following presentation is general information only and does not take into account your personal circumstances. Whilst Nucleus Wealth aims to present informing and sometimes entertaining content, please consult your investment professional, financial advisor, or better yet, speak to us before making any decisions based on any of the themes discussed in today's presentation. And don't forget that this is a live presentation, so feel free to drop any questions you like in the chat box below and we can answer them along the way. If you're watching this after the event, make sure you attend the next one so you too can participate in the live Q&A section of our presentation. Our presenters today include myself, Tim Fuller, a certified financial advisor who's worked with hundreds of clients over the years, helping to make the complex simple for companies such as AMP, Mercer and independent advisories. We also have David Llewellyn Smith, co-author of The Great Crash of 2008 with Ross Garneau, founder of the internationally acclaimed Diplomat magazine and now chief editor of the enormously popular Macro Business Financial blog. Finally, we have Nucleus Wealth's Head of Investments, Damien Klassen, whose 25 years in the world of finance has seen him as the founding partner and head of research at analyst firm Aegis Equities, head of quantitative strategy at Wilson HTM, and was responsible for mining energy and big data in the $60 billion global quantitative equity fund at Schroders, who are a multinational asset management company. And for more information, please check out the Our People section at www.nucleuswealth.com. Yes, so hello and welcome to our next instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the how-to of international investing. So obviously international investing is uh, one of the core components of what we do every day at Nucleus Wealth and the MB Fund. Uh, probably one of the, you probably say it's one of the jewels in the crown, essentially what we do in the international space. So I think we're, we're working from a good base in, uh, in today's topic. Uh, we'll jump into an agenda. So um, we thought we'd keep it pretty basic, but essentially we're looking at um, initially, of course, why we would look uh, look overseas uh, then of course uh, what various things you can look to invest in overseas uh, and then finally of course how you can actually put this into into practice uh, in either your, uh, either by yourself or, or engage some help as well so uh, with no further ado let's uh, jump into it g'day Damien hey Tim I might actually just quickly add too that uh, unfortunately uh, David Llewellyn Smith is, uh, is unavailable today. If you saw that just in the intro there, um, unfortunately he's decided to live a little bit too close to a highly flammable uh, fat, what was it? mattress factory, um, which is uh, presently uh, ablaze. So uh, he, he hasn't been able to come in, but he sends his regards. So <laughs> anyway, let's jump into it, Damien. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, so yeah, look, the, the key thing, we've got, a, we've got a chart there just showing a few, few um, countries around the world. One of the, one of the key things uh, for investing overseas is just that uh, Australia is a very small market. In, in, in the global in the global scheme of things, and uh, the number of companies you can get overseas, and the ones that even uh, that, that that sell products into Australia, um, you, know, you go through the, your, your list of your uh, you know your Kellogg's and your and your Coca Colas and your um, you know all your soft drinks and your your, 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 your traditional food. There's sort of 3M that does a lot of, and, and Unilever that does sort of a lot of your your, your shampoos and, and and those types of products. Is you, you just can't get access to that type of um, those types of companies within the Australian market, or, or certainly not within within size. So um, you know, getting out to uh, you know most people live on staring at a, a small rectangular device, and and none of those devices actually get made in, in Australia. You know they're all either Apples or, or Samsungs or or you know a bunch of different Chinese brands. So so getting access to to the uh, the, the the products you're actually selling and 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 some of the newer products. Um, yeah, it's pretty key to, uh, to to the investment and sort of diversifying away from your in terms of your portfolio. Okay, sure thing. And so um, I guess uh, jumping across from uh, the well, looking still at the, at the why rather, but um, the from a, from a, an equity standpoint here, we've got a, a neat little graph showing uh, twelve month forward uh, is earnings per shares. Is mm. that right? Yep. Yeah, Australia versus the US, showing Australia. Um, Fairly volatile in comparison to the US, which was interesting, um, but also a pretty big departure in the last sort of uh, couple of years. Yeah, it's certainly headed in the wrong wrong direction over the last few years. Um, I think the so this is sort of in, in terms of the why investing overseas. Um, 
for for our part is that now is actually a pretty good time still. Um, so there's there's been a few. Um, it's been a it's been a, it's been a very good time to invest overseas uh, for the last sort of four or five years. Um, but we don't think that's finished yet. So there's a um, and as you can see from this graph, uh, this is just, just showing very much the as Tim was saying that the, the stark contrast between the US and Australia, where where the US is on a 45 degree line going upwards in terms of the earnings growth, uh, whereas Australia is sort of flatlining and and you know if you took it over a four or five year period, it's a it's almost a 45 degree line going downwards. You could draw from the the the, the chart. Absolutely. So um, you know it, it's a. Uh, Australia's been through two massive booms, uh, you know, and and booms from a you know a, a decade long or sort of longer than decade sort of um, uh, uh, time so, frame. Time so frame, yep. yeah, so we've basically got this this big housing boom we've we've been through recently, where the the, the amount of building that's been going on and and that's sort of tapering off, and, and that uh, housing boom followed on the on the back of uh, a huge mining boom. And so Australia is sort of going through a um, you know a period where it's got to consolidate and it's got to got to, got to move and, and, and adjust as, as as those two booms uh, finish off and, and that we've seen that in, in terms of the weak earnings per share growth and that's to, to our mind that looks set to continue whereas um, there's other countries where they're they're starting their 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 booms and and or, you know midway through their booms in, in case of the in case of the US mm. and so trying to trying to get access to to um, you know, some some earnings some earnings growth and uh, trying to get access to to other markets that aren't um, uh, focused on to, pretty heavily on a, on a few individual sectors in Australia especially because a lot of a lot of Australians also will either work in in industries that are that are um, Affected by those, even in if in terms of real estate or, or the mining sector, but also uh, you know banking and, and finance sectors that are quite heavily um, backed to those those sectors as well. Sure. Um, and then yeah, so so yeah, the idea is that uh, you know the the big why at the moment is is we still think there's there's scope for that to to continue to con- uh, for to outperform in um us uh, sorry from a from an international perspective compared to a, an aussie perspective so it's really it's it's more of a um a case perhaps of um uh, australia just looking like it's going to provide less opportunity than than the rest of the world um yeah is that yeah yeah absolutely okay. yeah the tides tides going out uh, going out <laughs> is it out? Yeah. And, 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 and and coming in, in in some of these other countries okay sure all yeah. right very good um so we'll jump across now to um, another obviously key component of international investing being um, the ability to to uh, move money offshore essentially is that is yeah. that the, the purpose so, here? so it's worth noting the Australian dollar is um, is quite uh, it's quite an interesting um, dynamic for for investors because so what happens is when the Australian dollar falls your investments overseas actually rise so if you've uh, bought something for for one dollar in in the US and and um, that takes you you know to get a dollar of US um, takes you a dollar thirty of Australian and then the Australian dollar falls so you know now you, your value in in Aussie dollars has actually gone up yep. as, okay. as, as the Australian dollar falls sure so what that means for um, is it actually helps on the volatility side so see, the Australian market is is treated as a a growth engine for the world because because we're so heavily um, into resources, what tends to happen is when world growth is going very strong, mm-hmm. uh, the Australian dollar tends to rise because commodity prices are, are, are rising or expected to rise. Okay. Whereas the reverse happens when world growth is weak, um, the Aussie dollar tends to fall, and um, uh, and so you get the the opposite effect. So, but but what that means is when the world market's growing quite strongly, you will usually then also see stock markets growing quite strongly. Mm. And then when the reverse happens, um, so so what it means is the the Aussie dollar works as a cushion for for Australian investors. Right. Yep. For um, for anyone investing from overseas, though, it's actually the opposite. The Australian dollar acts as a bit of a turbocharger. So okay. uh, if you're investing in, and we've got sort of pulled up a, a chart now to sort of showing the um, some of the returns you you would have got over the last five years. So if you're a um, a Australian investor investing in in world markets. You would have basically doubled your money over, Killed the, it. over the last five years. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Um, if you're a US investor investing in the same market, um, you're up sort of seventy-ish percent. Mm. Um, there's a um, and then then you sort of fall back to okay, well if you're an Australian investor investing in Australia, you're sort of more like up fifty percent. And the worst outcome was the um, was the the US investors investing in Australia where they've basically made no money over that time period. And so and is that just a, a clearly a reflection of a reasonably flat 
Aussie market combined with a falling falling dollar. So they've yeah. had yeah. <laughs> and so and, and and part of there's there's two the the biggest long term drivers. So we had that that earnings chart up there which showed the earnings are growing in a, in, a, in uh, growing overseas whereas and falling in Australia yep. so that that sort of uh, put a, a damper on the market then the Aussie dollar falling mm-hmm. um, made most of the uh, most of the rest of this and, and from our perspective um, that's that's still expected to continue so so the benefit from a uh, from for investing overseas is, is you, you get to actually reduce some of your volatility or certainly over the, over the over the last five years you have and we're expecting these trends to continue on for for some time still is that you actually reduce your volatility um, because when markets fall the US dollar tends to fall as oh, sorry the Aussie dollar tends to fall as well yep. um, which which offsets you so markets might be down you know it, we saw down sort of ten percent at the start of the year, and the Aussie um, in, in Aussie dollar term, in, in US dollar terms they were down ten percent, but in, in Aussie terms they only sort of fell more like um, sort of five or six percent mm. because that you had that offsetting effect of the the, the Aussie dollar. Yep. And then on the um, yeah, so so you get that sort of nice nice relationship um, that you, that you don't get sort of if you're an investor investing in Australia coming the other way. Okay, sure thing. So so on the why side, why invest overseas? Um, there's opportunities. Um, there's diversification benefits, and then um, there's a, uh, a volatility benefit as well. Mm, okay, fantastic. Well, plenty of uh, plenty of whys there, Damien. So um, let's yes. jump into the what's. So what what are available, I guess, to um, to the everyday, to the retail investor, I guess, mm. essentially um, for for anyone listening at home, um, by way of getting access to these uh, overseas markets. Yeah. So so there's there's obviously individual stocks or, or funds that you can that you can buy. I think the um, there's a increasingly we've we've got we've got access to to various markets that you can trade sort of whether it's through a Comsec or an E-Trade or, or some of these online brokers. Um, yep. we'll you know, that, touch on those a bit later on. Yeah, yep. very much opening up the markets. It's still uh, they're still quite hard to trade in terms of um, some of the emerging markets. That's that sort of pretty hard at the moment. You generally need to go through a managed fund if you if you're looking for emerging markets. Okay, but uh, generally speaking, it's 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 not the cost is is reasonably at the moment um yep. as long as you're not doing too much trading mm-hmm. uh if, if this is talking about if you're, if you're doing it individually from fund manager perspective the costs are very low you know that the the um the fees just keep getting squeezed especially in the u.s market mm-hmm. um and so yeah so so it's it's much more um if you're investing through fund managers you know, the trading costs aren't particularly high sure um, so yeah, so let's jump onto the indexes though. So the first thing, you know, a lot of people say when they're saying, well, I'll, I'll just buy an index. Um, and, and indexes are basically groups of stocks that have been grouped up. So most people probably would have heard of the, the S&P 500, um, which is quite well known. There's um, MSCI is pretty big in terms of when you're doing international investing. Um, they they have sort of groupings of stocks around the world that they, that they put into categories. Um, the issue is, uh, and I've got a chart up here showing over the last few years, this is just for the US market, the number of stocks that are listed um, and the number of indexes out there. And there's now more indexes than what there are stocks. That's amazing. Yeah. That's absolutely amazing. So you're talking, you know, four or 5,000 odd stocks and, and um, you know, uh, seven or 8,000 um, uh, indexes that are out there. Wow. Uh, and this is, sorry, and these are listed ones. Mm. Um, if you want to go into unlisted, uh, now you're talking. So, that if you look at those, there's, there's, there's only 14 major index providers out there. Sure. Yep. And if you add up all of the 14 and, and say take all the things, how many indexes do you do, and, and add up all the different things, you get something like um, I think 3.3 million or something like that. Wow. And of which over 3 million are um, are, are equity indexes yep. because of all of these bond indexes and things like that. So, um, and globally, you know, there's there's um, there's only probably you know forty or fifty thousand odd listed companies worldwide. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, you, you, there's there's that very much a disconnect. So so figuring that yes, I'll buy um, I'll buy I want to get some exposure to inter- international. I don't really understand the shares, so I'll just buy an index. Um, sounds easy in practice, but the, but it, 
it sounds easy in theory, but the practice is there's actually way more indexes out there, and so it's, it's almost as, as, con- as confusing. You need to sort of work out what, what index am I actually buying. Well, yeah, it's, it's almost the same as choosing a, essentially a stock then if you've got the same palette of, of options or the same pa- or number more. of options, yeah, or more. Yeah. Okay, that's, yeah, that's actually, that's really fascinating. Okay, so some common indexes then, not looking at your, um, the, the, uh, the smaller ones, I guess, but maybe yeah. kicking off with the bigger ones. Yeah, so the bigger ones, um, so MSCI, the FTSE and the S&P are, are uh, are usually the, the big ones that everyone talks about um, and, and quotes. So uh, the the FTSE is, is the UK ones um, and runs some some European ones as well. S and P runs some runs the Australian one plus it runs um, US and there's there's they all have overlaps. They all have um, indexes as I said you know with four you know, three points three million indexes. You know if you want an index for something they've probably got one. Sure. Um, the big ones I tend to focus on uh, the MSCI World Index. That's sort of 1600 top 1600 stocks around the world. Yep. Uh, so it's about six, uh, and it's equivalent to about there's about 70 odd ASX stocks in that. So, and this is only developed countries. Right. So yep. you're not getting exposure to your Chinas and and Brazils and, and places like that. Um, then the MSCI has a, an Emerging Markets Index um, with sort of 800 odd stocks. Okay. And so they sort of um, yeah, they. they they join together in this this funny thing they call the the, the ACWI index, right? But, but so, but it's not a bad way to to look at it. Um, you know, is is your world for your developed, and then your your EM for your 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 emerging markets, uh, and then they've got another one which is the what they call the IWI, which is sort of eight and a half thousand stocks, which is sort of equivalent to the ASX two hundred. Mm, okay, and so that sort of um, gives you a feel for uh, you know the, the the numbers you're dealing with. Uh, and some of the ones people probably would have heard of. Um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're looking now to say, okay, well, if, if I just want a broad index, you know, they're the types of indexes you'd look for in, in terms of your ETFs. <coughs> sure. If, you look, if you're looking for a, for a size-based index for a particular country, um, I've got a few up on the next slide, but they're, they're ones like uh, the S and P 500 in the US, um, the uh, the FTSE 100 in the UK, and and in in Europe the the Stoxx 600. Um, so they're, they're mostly the ones you'll hear uh, quoted when when you when you're listening to the financial news or, or reading. They'll they'll generally quote these indexes. Sure. And yep. there's usually ETFs that sort of back those that, that are quite easy to get. Yep. But it, but it is worth noting that um, you've got to be aware of what you're really buying. So if you're buying the the S and P 500 index, um, you you're basically getting multinational companies in a way. You, these are all listed in the US, mm. but doesn't mean they they're all just US companies. So if you're buying, um, say McDonald's, uh, McDonald's is in God knows every so many country countries. of the world. Yeah, basically, <laughs> probably easy to count the ones it's not in. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, and and so you are getting diversified exposure to to the world. Um, you know, you go to um, some of your 3Ms and and places like that, or GEs, and and they've got quite they've got global reach. Yep. And so um, if you wanted just the US, so if you sort of went, okay, well, I. I uh, I, I just want exposure to the US. Then, then the Russell 2000 is the most common one, okay. which is a, a sort of a small cap index in the US. So it basically excludes the top thousand companies mm-hmm. and just every company between 1,000 and 3,000. Right. And yep. so you generally get more US exposure, but it's not it's, it's not made to be a, a US centric. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's just that that's what you generally do get if you buy the Russell 2000. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I guess, well, ultimately, um, and this is, I guess, harking back to the, your point before, but the, you know, the ETF sort of lever to pull um, really only looks at a couple of metrics. Is it on that exchange or is it in that market? And yes. is it, how big is it? And that's whether or not it fits into the index effectively. Absolutely. Then, yeah. then, then you bought it. Then you're on your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, sure thing. Um, we've got an interesting one here on, on the emerging markets. So, um, yeah, so the key thing to note with emerging markets is they're not big at all. So um, the GDP of China is is relatively close to the the GDP of the US, depending upon how you want to measure it um, uh, in terms of currencies. Um, but China's a very very small part. It's sort of on the uh, so part of this um, what is it under four percent of the of the global equity markets. Wow. Yep. So uh, not it's it's not a not a big amount. Um, and then frontier markets, are, which are the sort of the the even smaller one, you know another. Uh, step behind don't even appear on this they're so small so uh, it's also worth noting yeah so we've got France on this um, 
on this graph, but there's no Germany because the German stock market's not that big as well. So yeah, right. in, in France, you know, compared to the UK is, you know, quite the stock market's significantly smaller in, in France than, than what it is in the UK wow. as well. So, yep. um, and is that a factor of the of just there's just not a lot of public companies in in those countries? So like I know Germany's a largely an SME sort of based economy, mm. isn't it? So they don't naturally go public automatically once yeah. they hit a certain size. So it's a mixture of private companies. Sometimes it's it's a a listing thing that that uh, the companies might actually be French or or German companies, but happen to be listed in the US or listed in okay. in, um, in the UK. Yep. Uh, there's um, uh, and and there's bigger debt markets in some of those markets as well. Okay. Um, so some of the, the, it is just about how it, a lot of the size of the market comes down to your biggest players and are, do they happen to be listed in, in those markets or not? Mm. Uh, and so, um, you know, let's say for oil, for example, none of the, there's no really big oil stocks listed in, in, in Germany. Um, France has got Total, but that's about it. But yep. that's sort of, um, whereas the US and, and UK have got quite a lot of quite large oil companies. And so, yeah, that's sort of, those types of things sort of, um, make a big difference to to the number of stocks. Okay, sure. So um, I think what I'm trying to get back to with this, though, is that don't don't get too hung up on the classifications. So um, Samsung, for example, rates as a as an emerging market stock notionally mm. because um, it's in Korea and Korea is counted as an emerging market. Mm. And so whereas um, Samsung as a company, when when you look at it, you know it shows the same dynamics as you see from most of you know from an Apple or from most of these sort of electronic companies. You you, you get semiconductors and, and things like that. You'll see within the US. Yeah, broad, broadly diversified and world global company, but just on an unfortunate market. Um, yeah. yeah, so okay. you do need to be a bit careful about saying, well, w- when I'm buying these things, especially say say you're buying emerging markets and you're saying, well, I want I want all this great growth that I can get from these emerging markets. Um, is is going well? If I'm buying Samsung, uh, am I getting exposure to emerging markets, or are I really just getting exposure to US and and European consumers who buy Samsung phones? Just getting a Korean Apple. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so um, the other thing is, you know, you go through these emerging markets, and and the Russian energy sector is quite big. Mm. Um, and there's um, Gazprom is is one of the the, the big ones there. Um, so state owned entity, well not sorry, not state owned entity. They're, <laughs> they um, they the state. Um, there's there's a lot of relationships between the state and that company that that don't exist in other countries. Let's mm. put it that way. Okay. Um, Delicately put there. Well done. I'll yeah. unlock the doors again. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the issue is, um, you know, if you're saying, oh, I just, oh, you know, let me get this emerging market exposure. Let me go and buy. And they're saying, if you, I'll just buy an ETF in 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 emerging markets. Is saying, well, did you really want lots of exposure to to companies that you know? Um, uh, I've got political risk in in mm. Russia and and effectively you know run from that. Yep. Um, the other thing is when you and when you look through China, people are like, oh, China's this great growth market and we're going to um, get lots of access to it. A lot of the companies in there are what's called state-owned entities, mm. and these are the biggest companies in that market, and they're the ones that are. Um, uh, sorry, almost stealing. The um, yeah, so the biggest some of the biggest companies in that market are, are state-owned entities, which which are partially government owned mm. and, and so don't just don't answer to, to shareholders shareholders are the second person they answer to so if, if the government turns around and says well we want you to go and spend a whole bunch of money over here at an uneconomic return because we need to get employment up yep um, or we don't want you to fire these workers because we want to make sure that you know, we're trying to call a, re- a, re- a revolt <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Then, yep. then these companies will be, be acting for the state rather than for um, rather mm. than for uh, the, the other shareholders. That's a fair point. And they are um, by far and away the biggest part of that that, that Chinese market. So yep. again, if you if you just want to jump in and buy an ETF, is saying well, so you buy you bought an emerging markets ETF. How much Russian energy did you really want, and how <laughs> much? Um, Chinese state-owned entities did you really want because they're the biggest exposures in your portfolio. Yeah, okay. Yep. So, yeah, so being careful about what you're buying. All right, sure thing. Um, we'll move into um, the next stage, the next page of yeah. emerging markets. So then, then you get to... Um, uh, so this is looking at... A, and sorry, I haven't titled this very well. This is looking at the, the price-to-earnings ratios for uh, the world versus emerging markets. And so what that is, is it's just a, a, a relatively basic version of um, measure of value. Mm-hmm. And so it's looking at the next 12 months. Um, so basically the price you pay for a stock is about 14 times, uh, sorry, almost 15 times higher for the world markets. 
um, whereas for an emerging market, it's it's more like thirteen times. So you get you get a bit of a discount. I was going to say it doesn't seem like a lot of a discount, though, does it? Is it? No. So so what is fifteen percent discount? Yeah. Type okay. thing. So yep. and, and it's probably that's relatively typical in terms of in terms of that. And so and most people that and that, I guess that's. Um, the idea is that it's meant to then attract people to the to the emerging markets, and they're meant to be growing faster and, and things like that. Yep. Um, the important part is though, uh, if you've got a lot of Russian energy trading on five times earnings, that sort of drags that version down, and or state owned Chinese state owned entities, and where people are saying, well, I don't want to, I don't want to spend twenty times uh, their earnings to buy a Chinese state owned entity. I'll, I'll give you eight times for it. Yeah. Okay. And so that drags that emerging markets down. So then I've got then if you if you actually look and say well um, pick a sector that you would like to get emerging markets as and the most common one people look at is um, is health and and health technology um, is then you look and go well uh, if I buy you know health services for example um, uh, you pay eighteen point five times eighteen point six times for the, for world earnings so yep. a bit more growth a bit more stability so people sort of paying up a little bit more for that and you say well yeah but I want to get I want access to these Chinese markets and the, and the Indian markets where you know the the middle class is growing and more people can afford these and you're saying well now you've got to pay thirty one times to get that from an emerging market exposure yeah sure okay or, or so, the, technology. so 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 to sort of put this in a nutshell um, the 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 issue that arises with the emerging market um, just in general is just that it is so diverse and it's a sum of so many little parts that mm. some are incredibly up, overbid some are questionable in ownership origin and intent of actually being on a on a stock market that yeah. you're sort of getting this this bag this assortment absolutely that, yeah the average is out to look look okay on on the on the average but contains some some interesting uh, yeah. components so if you want emerging markets exposure that's my yeah where i'm coming back to is saying well you need to be pretty careful about what you're buying okay like buying a blind index you get, you're probably not getting the stocks you really wanted to get exposure to mm, okay yeah. yeah great point okay very good um and so then uh jumping into uh, some strategies uh with uh with the indexes yeah so 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 we ran through some of the size-based indexes and some of the country-based indexes that are all region-based. And then you say, well, what are the other types of things you can do? There's a whole bunch of these ones, which I won't go too much into detail, but you can get um, uh, your value indexes, quality, growth. Um, there's all these smart beta versions where you try and get low volatility or, or you're getting momentum from, from trading. Um, yeah, a whole bunch of different indexes, which is where they come up, and, and your ESG type indexes, which is why they we end up with millions of indexes once once they've sort of done all the different permutations and combinations by by different markets. And, and I, I guess given the um, sort of stratospheric rise and, and interest and popularity, it just makes sense that at some point we're going to probably hit peak ETF. Is that is that sort of a, a peak index for yeah. want of a better word? Maybe <laughs> not, not for a few years. I okay. Think. I yeah. Think right. still, I mean, in in the end, there's a lot of ETFs that close down as well. But mm. it, um, I think. The way I would think about a lot of ETFs, there there's some very good ones that are that are very um, that give you your market based type, you know, your S and P five hundred ones that are a couple of basis points and of in, cost of cost, yeah, yeah, sure. And there's there's actually some ones now that are doing free, um, wow, free. They're, they're, there's no exchange traded funds yet, but they're they're doing free index funds because they make they basically make their money from lending stock okay. in the US. So these are large liquid markets, and they, you can get very very low costs. And, and sort of, um, you, know, you jump in and grab those. Then, then it's all about marketing. Mm. Saying, well, let me design a tech ETF because people are interested in tech right now. Yep. And then next, you know, next time it'll be a, a solar and green energy one, or it's basically whatever they think they can sell. Yep. And the, and the benefit of, of, of having ETFs is that, um, especially based on indexes, for the people selling them, is going, well, we're not telling you this is going to be good. We're just, we're just trying to. Find something that's we're just trying to get something shiny that's going to attract your attention. Yeah, and then if it doesn't perform well, that, that that's your that's your problem. Okay. Yep. And sure. So um, fascinating. And the other and so a lot of these will just buy the stocks regardless of value or 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 anything. Yep. Value, quality, growth. So whereas I, I tend to like you know if you're looking for for indexes or, or something sort of these these ETFs is is ones that actually at least give some sort of nod to either a value or a quality type measure, so you can actually say well. I know that I'm not just buying overvalued stuff and I'm chasing the latest fad yep. is that there's some sort of um, mean reversion type. Yeah, type okay. Well, some some, some method in the madness. And we'll ch touch on that in a little bit anyway. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so just uh, we'll just zoom through the in the final uh, watts is, uh, of course, the, 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 the Forex the part. The currency. We, yeah, yeah, we spoke about it at the start there. So, so the currency part is in, what's important for this is to, ignore, is to work out where the companies are listed 
Uh, sorry, not where they're listed, uh, to work out what they're actually exposed to. Okay. We're, everyone, um, most of the indexes all do it by where they're listed. So if you buy the FTSE 100, which is a, the UK, top top stocks in the UK, yep. you get a lot of multinationals. You actually get very, very little UK exposure. Okay. And so if you're looking for UK exposure, um, you know, if I'm buy, out buying stocks, then, you know, I'm looking at UK stocks. I'm sort of working out, okay, this this is listed in the US, sorry, listed in the UK, so say um, Unilever, listed in, in the UK, UK is maybe its third or fourth biggest market, mm, you know, okay. so it's main exposure to the US and then China and then you start working through. So it's, so it's essentially a US company, um, you know, for, foreign listed US company for, for a revenue sort of purpose anyway. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yep. And so, um, yeah, so very important to, most of these indexes all come back to um, where are they where are they listed? Mm. I'm more interested, and, and and so I've got a, a just a, a pie chart show showing you it's US 58 percent, um, Europe sort of 24 percent, and then Japan's about a little bit under 10, and and then the rest of the, the world sort of falls into the, the final. And this 10. is of the world index, is it? That's of the world index. Yeah, okay, yeah. sure. But but more of more interest to me is jumping into the foreign currency side, and and that's where you start saying well. Just because something's listed in Europe, um, okay, if, it, if it's mainly exposed to the euro, uh, that's different than if it's exposed to um, you know, the, the, the Swiss franc or if it's exposed yeah. to the... Because it's um, obviously got currency tailwind pound. or headwinds from its own revenue streams, essentially. Absolutely. So yeah. they make a big difference to, to performance. So for me, it's it's coming back, to, back about saying, well, where is this company really exposed to? Mm-hmm. And not just sort of taking it, it oh, yeah, I've bought it... I've, you know, I bought the FTSE 100, so now I've got exposure to the to the UK. It's like, well, you've got a bit, but you you haven't got anywhere near as much as you think you do. Because yeah, yeah. You've, you've bought a lot of these multinationals. That's a that's a great point. So, okay, mm. fantastic. All right, and um, I think we're getting pretty close to the end of our what, but we'll yeah. just jump just zoom uh, quickly through some differences. Um, and this is a is this Australia versus the world? These this is numbers Australia we've got versus up here? the world. Yeah. Okay. So the key thing I wanted to do is just sort of run in terms of the sector side. So we sort of run through currencies. We've run through. The, the the sizes and we've run through um, yeah the, the different types of um, funds you can get. Now I wanted to do a say, well, when I'm buying overseas, what what are the what are the big things I'm getting that I can't get in Australia? Sure. So uh, banks in Australia is about a third of the market. Um, it's sort of sub ten percent of the uh, of international markets, and they're different banks. Uh, you tend to get in. Um, in the US, there's there's sort of thousands of banks in the US, and there's some big ones um, which tend to be investment type banks. So your Goldman Sachs and your Morgan Stanleys. Sure. Yep. You've got a few of the global banks, whether it's your HSBCs and Citibanks and, and JP Morgan Chase, and then there's this huge long tail of, of thousands, literally thousands of, of smaller banks, which basically just do very simple um, borrowing and lending. Okay. And so um, yeah, so a very different market. You know, Australia is dominated by banks. Offshore isn't. Yep. Um, Australia uh, REITs, so, so real estate trusts and miners. Australia, again, is just dominated by these uh, compared to the rest of the market. So what you find is that in um, uh, uh, Australia's got probably three times the size, three times as many um, real estate Trusts as, as as what you find in the in the world index. Well, that stands to reason, given Australia's uh, love but, affair with property. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's a, the, uh, uh, mining, we've sort of got ten times as much. So, so in terms of, um, if you're an Australian fund manager, you know your, your biggest call is is are you going to buy banks? Or are you going to buy resources? Or um, yeah, so that's a that's a a key a key issue for for Aussie um, fund managers. Mm-hmm. For an international fund manager. You can easily be zero weight mining and, and not not even notice the effect on your on your performance. So and and typically, you know, if you're if you're looking offshore, um, you know, the idea is that mining itself as an activity, you know, globally is is a very small proportion of the overall value chain. Yep. It's just that it happens to be in Australia. We've got a concentrated yeah. group of stocks, and so that's what we're good at. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> digging but, digging things out of the ground and selling it to other people. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, for most people, you say, well, if if the price of um, uh, iron or, 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 or and copper, copper and everything doubles. That's going to make a, a, a relatively small effect on my entire life. So the fact that I, um, yeah, the fact that I've got exposure in my stock market portfolio, it's not it's not really offsetting any of your own natural costs. Okay. Whereas you know if if you if you're looking at the the cost of your your, your everyday goods and saying well if they doubled, um, you know, and I've got big investments in Australia in, in banks and mining and, and real estate. Well, I haven't got now got an off-setting gain somewhere else in my portfolio that okay. I can, 
Yeah. Sure. So, um, so it was so software hardware is um, software and IT hardware is basically twenty percent of the world index. It's base it's effectively zero. Yeah. You know, sub sub one percent in Australia. Um, there's. Uh, so it's it's very different as well. You sort of need to be careful about what you're buying. So so there's this semiconductors they call them, which is your Intel's and Qualcomm's and applied applied materials, which have this very high capex cycle. So they're they're out building factories or, or uh, for the latest chips or building um, you know, machines to to manufacture the latest chips yep. and spending lots on R and D. Sure. And then you get the latest hit and your stock price goes bananas and then. Um, the next one's a flop, and somebody else takes over, and so and you come back to earth. And so, there, um, there's, there's certainly some very interesting companies, but but you do need to be aware that the, the, the dynamic of these is a very high capex figure. Yep. Um, and then massive margins for periods, and then losses for other periods, and yeah, it's a very cyclical. So it sounds almost like a pharmaceutical company as well, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, not yep. not too dissimilar to those. Except the the thing with pharmaceuticals is you get your patents. Um, you get a long tail. Tend to last for a long time, and, and you so um, yeah, you got to go through a long to, to get your latest drug through the FDA and all that's quite a long process, and then you get a long period of, of, of it before you do it. It's basically like if you compress that cycle up. You get it for the semiconductors because, in the end, nobody needs you. Once this once this chips faster than the last set of chips, people roll it straight out. You're done. Yep. But, okay. And and so you're the you're the flavor of the minute. But as soon as you're uh, as soon as you're not anymore, your sales fall pretty pretty quickly. Okay. Sure. Um, it's also noting that uh, you know, in some of those markets you get your um, uh, so your your Nokia and BlackBerry type type thing. So so it's big big tech holdings, but they they were. Uh, again, flavor of the minute, but then faded very quickly once they um, once they disappeared from the or once they they were no longer the the, the best um, the best out there. Sure. Uh, the auto sector is quite big, more than five percent of the world. Again, largely non-existent in Australia. Um, these stocks are pretty cheap in general, um, but uh, it is worth noting there's a lot happening in that sector. There's a lot of them have these really big pension liabilities, particularly in the US. So it sort of makes a, a difference there, and and they, a few of them went broke or, and got restructured during the financial crisis, and so there's there's various um, sort of bits bits and pieces going on over there. Yep. And then the final one I just wanted to do was the um, the retail sector, so which is um, you know Amazon with sort of um, the massive behemoth in the sector, mm-hmm. so by far and away bigger than 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 any of the other ones. And trading on extremely expensive multiples, yep. um, and then the flip side is a lot of these other smaller companies around. So it's almost a. Um, it's David and Goliath. Yeah, it's David and Goliath. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it's, it's a two. It's a it's a two stage sector in terms of you know two speed. Yeah. Sort of, yep. Okay. And, and, well, probably in three speed. You're either Amazon, <laughs> you're um, Amazon proof. Yeah. And so you trade a sort of more notable, or you're Amazon exposed, and you you're. Um, trade on sort of very very cheap multiples, and, and everyone expects your earnings to get sort of uh, drift away over the next few years. Okay, sure thing. All right, very good. Um, so we'll jump across now into um, research providers. So I guess this is just a, a quick overview on uh, obviously uh, where people can head if they wanted to check out uh, or the various opportunities mm. that are available to them. Um, and uh, we'll kick off with the the data providers. So yeah. you mentioned a comment so, uh, off air before that was interesting about. Where yeah. the data comes from? Yeah, so there's basically three data providers, uh, and of which which is Thomson Reuters in the world. In the, in the yeah, so there's I'll, I'll, add a, I'll add a fourth one at Bloomberg, but Bloomberg's um, pretty much they 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 don't gen- tend to resell their data. But you've got Thomson Reuters, FactSet, and then S and P Capital IQ. Yep, and uh, all these guys keep on buying each other. So there, there were lots of them. One one will pop up now every now and again, and then they'll get bought by the others, and then on they go again. But effectively, those guys um, then resell their data to pretty much any any site you can find that's got, In, got research us. data, <laughs> including us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, you, you, it probably comes from one of those three places. Sure. Um, so there's a Bloomberg's, uh, you know, the exam, the, the different one, but you know, Bloomberg's sort of twenty five thousand US a year for a, for a license. So you, you tend to have to be a pretty big investor to to want to get a Bloomberg. Yep. But um, you know, Iris, for example, a lot of people use is a Capital IQ, um, Yahoo Finance, and Google um, both use uh, Thomson Reuters. Uh, there's yeah, fact sets on a whole bunch of different sites as well. So yeah. So probably probably not immediately available to the everyday investor, but. Um yeah. What are some What are some other ones? Some other ones. And so okay. So the, yeah. What I was trying to do. Yes. Yeah, so to show you, this is where 
where else can you get information on it? So, so brokers, you can, certainly lots of brokers out there. Um, it is worth noting that uh, brokers tend to have two main clients. Um, there's corporates who they're raising money for. Mm-hmm. Is, is probably the, one of the biggest sources of income. Sure. They've got institutional investors, um, which are sort of the hundreds of millions of dollars of, uh, in terms of what they do trading for. And then in um, you know, a very, very distant third is, is a retail investor. Um, which so a mum and dad essentially with a stockbroker. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is, you can realise that you can get some good research from brokers and some very good research from brokers, but um, the research isn't written for you, and it may not be uh, the recommendation might be there as a sales piece rather than as a, a genuine recommendation. Mm-hmm. And so um, yeah, just be careful about what you what you're actually doing with that broker research. Cause, okay. Because you're. Um, you're, you're not their target market. You, yeah, you, okay. may, you may find that yeah, the, the recommendations are not not suited to you. Right. Um, lots uh, of different news sites are out there. Um, you know, FT.com and, and WSJ.com are the two big ones, biggest sort of news ones, which is the Financial Times in the UK and, and the Wall Street Journal. They tend to cover most of the... Um, if something happens to a big um, international stock, um, they'll, they'll have a news story on it. Sure, yep. Uh, there's obviously lots of different websites, free websites, and lots of paid websites out there. But you know, I'll leave people to to dig that through that themselves. Um, so you, then, you, once you've got your research, now you need a process. And I'll, I'll just kind of flick very quickly through this. But the idea is that um, there's so many stocks globally. Is you can't just sort of sit there throwing darts at a dartboard and saying, "Oh, let me go and have a look at this stock because I, I heard about something good about this." Because chances are, if you heard something good about it. Everyone else has heard something good about it as well. You're probably the last to know. Yeah, that's right. You <laughs> might be yeah, helping somebody else get out of their, their holding by, by buying in. Yep, sure. Um, so, yeah, so my, my take on it is, you know, I think you need to work out the quality of stocks. You need to have a little bit of a go at predicting growth, but but realizing that, that humans aren't very good at predicting growth. And mm-hmm. so you need to not put too much faith in growth forecasts. Trying to work out this value part. So... I think this is the part where, you know, if you took a company like a, an Apple, for example, is saying, okay, um, I can work out it earns very good margins and its earnings are relatively stable and um, you know, it's got very little debt and, and things like that. So I can work out this this picture and say, yes, it is a high quality company. Mm-hmm. I can come back to try and make some predictions on growth, but yep. then I need to realize that over the last few years, um, you know, consensus forecasts have doubled and halved, you know, over just a you know, single year of... I think it was 2016, and so people don't really have that that good of a, a hold on on where it is. So sure, you can do a little bit of prediction, but not too much. Establishing value then is the key part of saying you might have this good company and and uh, you like their product and, and all that type of stuff, but paying too much for it is 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 a, is a dangerous. Um, yeah, so if you, of course. So so you need to make sure that um, you know step number three is. How much is this? Co- how much should this company be worth? And we've got plenty of on my list of stocks that I follow every day that I'm like, yes, I love this company. Would love to own it. I think it's, that looks fantastic, but it's just way too expensive. And if it halves in price, I'm all over it. Yep. If it falls, you know, thirty percent, I might be starting to, to nibble away at it. Might but, be on the radar. But at yep. current prices, I just can't. Just yeah. waiting. So just waiting for a fire sale. Waiting for the stock tax sales at Myers. Absolutely. <laughs> and when the benefit of the international is, you've got such a large universe, you you don't have to chase. You know that the latest story. There's there's guaranteed to be something else out there that's that's cheap on a relative basis at least. That's a really good point. Yep. And then finally, there's some trading metrics. You know, some some people like them, some people don't. But but sort of the um, it's worth noting. You know, I, I tend to use the trading metrics as as trying to let me know where there where there might be a bit of fire. Um, well, yes. So you might see a bit of smoke from whatever it is falling prices or your know, momentum against the stock or um, short selling increasing or what you know a whole bunch of different metrics on that on those burning mattresses yeah <laughs> burning mattresses is just then coming back and saying okay well once once i've seen that some of that on the trading metrics um you know I'm, me personally i'm not buying or selling based on that but i am saying well if the trading metrics don't look good and i, I thought i was going to buy this stock i need to go and double check and make sure that the fundamentals all stack up and there's nothing else out there that i'm not so it's, it's sort of a confirming indicator essentially perhaps Something like that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Very good. All right. We'll, we'll quickly zoom through. So we've covered off on um, on, on what the uh, the everyday user should should consider. Let's jump in yeah. just quickly a little just bit about what, what we do. To do. Yeah. yeah. So, so I use the quant to, to sort of do that initial screen. So starting with the MSCI and get rid of anything that's low quality or expensive, and then sort of go through that detailed assessment of the next stocks, and then start looking for macro risks and and trying to work out exposure. So I, what I tend to do is. I sort of throw it at the financial model and say, okay, you come back with a portfolio. So when you say a financial model, it's essentially a, like it's an algorithm or quant- quantitative method. We've, we've got um, 
webinars on this one for anyone who's yeah. interested as well but um so you're using using the math sort of component of it to to help do quality uh smart beaters and, and value smart beaters they're, they're basically that quant side where you just go yep well, let me let the computer program the computer to do it and you tell me the cheapest stocks and the and the best quality stocks yep um then for me is saying, well, the computer often gets it wrong, gets, yep. it, gets it right more often than not. Yep. So it's certainly better than, than not having a process. But there is that, but that part about now going through their companies and working out which ones of these has it got wrong because you know, the model doesn't realize about the politi- political risk or it doesn't realize about they've just lost a major contract or whatever it is. Yep, sure. Okay, very good. And we've got our, um, my, favorite, my favorite nucleus wealth graph, which is our quality it's value uh, universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically on, on one axis, we, we have our, our value, which is the, the x-axis, so from cheap to expensive. And then on the vertical axis, we do from, from high quality up to uh, low quality. And we basically want to buy stuff that's in the bottom left-hand corner. So if, if you're cheap and, and high quality, we'll, we'll be buying you. Yep. And um, if you're expensive and low quality, we won't. And so we basically try and buy stocks within that. And then as they drift in and drift out, we're then buying or selling or and reassessing as to, to which of the companies. There's a bunch of companies often in that, in that bottom left-hand corner that don't deserve to be there. They're value traps. So something like a, a BlackBerry or someone like that might have appeared there for a few years in that... Um, Looked great on historical earnings, but um, was going nowhere yep. sort of on a future basis. So. Okay, very good. And, and we'll quickly dive through just a couple of the um, the definitions of, of quality and value as well. So yeah, so so quality is all these ones you hear the the Warren Buffettism type economic moats and and you know have you got growth and have you got stable earnings and and you haven't got too much debt. On the value side, um, there's another. You want to jump to on the yep. value side. You can uh, hundreds of different ways to look at it. I, we tend to try and look. For on, an earning, on a cash flow side and break that out separately to the earnings side okay you can quite often get very different views on on those uh, the, the earnings look great but the cash flows don't or mm. vice versa mm-hmm. and so that's sort of often a, a good tell your balance sheet um as to you know do you have asset backing and and um how much risk am i taking and then some of these i look a lot at returns which is a, yeah some of the are you, how much are you getting back from from shareholders, or how much could you've got back as a, as a payments that okay. they've reinvested in some way? That makes uh, plenty of sense. And uh, just finally, the um, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll jump through. All right, so um, so we'll jump through to um, the the how now. So um, I, I might kick us off with this one, but um, I'd look, obviously, in my experience in in advising, uh, there's there's plenty of different ways for you to uh, to get access to to the market. So I guess it really comes down to a number of factors which we'll run through now. Um, of course, you can choose your own stocks, and we've covered off on quite a few of the stocks um, and examples of stocks that we've we've sort of looked at it in the, in the past and have at the moment. Um, you can manage that yourself as a as an individual portfolio, and there's a number of um, opportunities to do this through uh, online broking, where you can just buy on on foreign markets um, at the moment, which has been great. And there's certainly been in the last few years um, probably demand driven than anything. Uh, you know, uh, a number of uh, online brokers that have come to the party on that, which is great. Um, you can also, of course, um, have it professionally managed um, and look to. Um, obviously you pay somebody to, to do that um, or you could um, perhaps uh, even explore doing a, a mixture of the two um, where you uh, you essentially you can have some components of, of areas that perhaps you 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 know you, it's not your forte or you're not very um, you know you haven't got the time to to invest uh, and then look to pick a few that you uh, that you've had your eye on or that you've read about um, jumping into that I guess so you know whether or not you want it, the fork in the road where you, you choose a self-managed portfolio um, or a professional management but we'll, we'll jump into the self-managed side first and as I mentioned before um, here's a here's a quick list of um, a number of the major if not probably all of the major uh, online uh, broking institutions that are um, that have brought out the ability to to trade now these costs are, I might just note are actually uh, only for US market trades which as we've covered off uh, earlier, is, is a significant component of, of where most people would like to invest, and it's where you know a large amount of opportunity lies. Um, but keep in mind that there is, you know, there is still some costs in this, and where you, you're typically paying five to say twenty dollars to, to to transact on the on the Aussie market, um, you, you're typically paying, you know. Between ten and and sixty, I can see there with ANZ. Um, I'm not sure. You, yeah, this is reasonably recent um, for, for 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 transacting in the overseas markets. Um, also, just checking out as well the the number of international markets, and I suppose this comes down to uh, firstly 
thinking about where you want to invest before you choose an online broker or a, or a broker that's capable of doing this to make sure that um, you, you know you, you are actually be able to, you're going to be able to transact in, in the markets that you're looking at. As you can see, it's a pretty stark difference. You, there, there's either all the major markets or, or it's quite limited as well. So I think that, that probably uh, is worth you know uh, some initial thought anyway before um, choosing a provider. Uh, and then uh, I guess <laughs> the next stage is, is then going about putting together a portfolio. Um, and this is just a, a range of, uh, I think these are all in the MISCI, these are in the MISCI world. Are these ones that we would typically invest in other, Damien? Uh, yeah. Yep. Or they're in our... There's a, there's a fair few of those that are in our portfolios at the moment. In our portfolio. I was wondering where I got them from. Um, but the idea is, you know, essentially then you've got to now come across or, or, or um, factor in one of the, the key tenets of, of good investment, which is diversification. Um, and you know this this will then mean having to hold multiple stocks uh, potentially and more than likely in multiple uh, sectors as well to try and give yourself diversification across so you're not just backing US tech stocks for example which is a common theme work well in the uh, in the past may not work so well in the future who knows um, and then thinking about the the brokerage associated with that and if you're paying a fixed fixed rate brokerage which should be most of these brokers you are until you're spending really big bucks um, you know, working out, okay, well, that's going to be a headwind to my performance. Um, but at the, at the same time, you know, is there any other way to go about it? Probably the biggest, the biggest thing to think about or the biggest uh, consideration when putting together portfolios like this now is that you've got your initial cost to get in, but then how are you going to add or manage this portfolio going forward as well and and that's that's a key part of it so depending on I guess what age and stage you're in typically if you're in the the younger cohort you'd be looking at starting perhaps smaller than you know or starting with what you've got and then looking to add to it over time and of course a big headwind then is that if you're paying a fixed rate of say let's call it twenty dollars on average for the US market to get in um, times uh, say 20 stocks well then that's going to be setting you back if you're if you're only investing small amounts and looking to accumulate a long term probably a slightly different um, uh, well, in a sense, a slightly different um, equation for someone who's already built their money. Maybe they're in an SMSF and they've got a large amount to invest. Um, but then at the same time, you've got to sell down at some point and then you've got to broadly sell down and go the other way. So uh, de-accumulate. So that's, that, is a, that is a focus. Jump into it. So as I mentioned there, look, um, obviously, yeah, plenty of, well, obviously one of the big pluses of running your own portfolio is the transparency and control. You've only got yourself to blame if you muck up, but you give yourself some pats on the back if you get it right. Um, and of course, the individual ownership. So, you know, dividends come what may in, in the foreign markets are going to be yours and they're not washed through a, through a pooled fund. Um, but then the flip side is, of course, that you've got the, the time um, and potentially experience barriers of having to maintain a you know a relatively large portfolio by most by most means and and making sure that you're on top of it um, and then of course if there are, there are some issues um, potentially with uh, tax situations um, and and foreign ownership as well and, and and setting everything up at the end of the year for for reporting anything to add Damien yeah so I mean it's the, the tax side sometimes gets overdone I think on on um, you yeah, the benefits of franking credits versus uh, versus overseas, you, you definitely get a lower dividend yield offshore, but what they tend to do is you get much higher buybacks. So your actual total return from companies is, is pretty similar. Right. Um, in terms of how much cash companies are actually putting back either by buybacks or by, by, by dividends. And what buybacks do is it makes the share price a little bit higher. So effectively, if you, pay, if you paid out a dividend for a 5% dividend every year, you'd expect the share price would, would fall by 5% as that dividend gets paid. Um, the same, the same. So, so the investors, you know, let's say the, let's say the share price rises five percent, then the pays the dividend falls five percent, and so you've made five percent over the entire year. Whereas, what would happen in the in the case of the the company with a buyback is they'd be doing buybacks throughout the year, and they'll add, you know, you'll end up with with a um, with a higher share price um, because they've actually bought bought back the shares, and so you'll end up with a five percent return. Um, but but it'll be in capital gains, which is often more attractive anyway for, for Australian investors to be mm. to be getting the returns back from international as capital gains. That's a good point. And the other thing is, there's you get a withholding tax often on almost always on most of these. So what that means is that it's a little bit like a franking credit in that um, it's usually at about fifteen percent for for most countries uh, from from Australia when you're investing for Australia. So if they pay a hundred dollars in dividends, you'll you'll get eighty five dollars of that as as cash. But you've got that fifteen dollars, which is like a franking credit in that it's tax you've already paid. The difference is you can't get it back if you're not paying any tax. 
Um, but you know, quite possibly, if, if we get a Labor government, that that won't be the case in Australia as well. So, but it, but it does count towards your your tax you've already paid, so you don't get double taxed on it. Mm, okay, yeah. Well, it's um, well, that's yeah, that's that's new uh, new information. I'm sure to a lot of people <laughs> thinking out there that that the Aussie uh, dividend stream is this uh, second to none, I guess. So, thanks mm. very much for that. Um, we'll zoom through um, just quickly on uh, a couple of different areas on the other side. So rather than self-managing, um, you may wish to, um, of course, um, have a look at uh, either getting some management or, or looking ex- at exchange traded funds as we've covered off uh, in some detail earlier. Um, look, obviously the pros with the managed funds and, and pooled um, you know, unitized structures in general is that they are typically very simple to administer. You've, you're buying units in a currently existing um, invested pool of money. Um, they then, uh, I guess, essentially, or well, given you know, in reflection to um, the online broking sort of model we just spoke about, but they, they potentially have lower brokerage because there's larger amounts. They're generally in this inter- institutional space, so they're, um, they're, they're moving around much larger amounts of money. So there's potential for less brokerage headwind there. Um, and from a tax situation, from, from a personal, from, as an investor's tax situation, um, fairly basic because you're just getting a, um, you know, you're getting a, a, a report at the end. Yeah, and actually one of the things to note on that low brokerage and transaction cost is that they'll, tr- especially in terms of currency, the wholesale guys and people doing through things through separately managed accounts or sort of the pool trust will get wholesale rates in terms of uh, exchanges. Okay. And yep. that might not always happen if you're in a brokerage account. Um, you know, sometimes you you might be looking at your brokerage that you're, you're paying and, and, and thinking you get a good good deal, but if they're also clipping, um, you know, an extra another ten, twenty, thirty dollars on on every trade for uh, for foreign exchange costs, that obviously adds up. Yep. Whereas you tend to find in a in a pooled or managed fund that that won't happen anywhere near as much. Okay. Yep. Sure thing. Um, I, I guess just on the on the flip side, then in the in the cons department, um, but look, one of the big issues is um, or one of the things you need to watch very carefully is the cost of of management. So obviously, managers, fee managers, or oh, sorry, uh, the fees that managers can ch- can charge um, can vary greatly depending on the manager. Um, there can be things like performance fees where. Um, and, and it's interesting, people think, well, a performance fee is great because it means that my manager is going to make sure that this fund performs really well for me. And, and of course, I'm happy to share with them uh, any any extra, uh, you know, bonus, give them a, a slice of, of, of our performance. What, what are your thoughts on that one, Damien? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of those. Um, I think there's, in, in some higher risk cases, there, there might be some scope for, for that. Um, my key one on... on um, on performance fees, as a as a as an owner myself of a of a company, is that if I'm getting paid performance fees, I'm not going to spend more money. I'm not going to pre-spend that money on on getting you better research. If you know what I mean. So yep. basically, um, if you're paying me a, a fixed fee, I can hire researchers around that and work out how much research I'm going to do. If I'm getting this this, and so in in and in turn, I should get a better return for 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 doing that. Um, if I'm getting paid a performance fee, though. Um, I'm not out there hiring new researchers with it. What with the performance fee I'm expecting. So mm. basically, the performance fee is going to your fund manager to give him his you know, his second yacht or or whatever <laughs> it is that 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 you know it's a bigger profit, and it's, it is probably not being put back into the fund in terms of helping out the performance okay. of the fund. It also then uh, leverages it so that there's more scope for him to take risks. So he's basically saying, well, if if I yeah, you know, if I if I flip the coin and and I take a bit more risk and I get a great performance and I, then I get this great return, I, you know I get this big performance fee. But if I if I if I comes out tails instead and I, and I underperform, well, clients don't often. Some will definitely leave, but you know they're not as many as the. Uh, I've got a much bigger upside than what I do downside. Yeah, everything to gain and not a lot to lose, essentially. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Fair enough. Um, just while we're still on the cons there as well, the um, one of the big issues with with any sort of pooled option is typically that there's very low levels of transparency. So what I mean by that, and you probably or you may have found this in the past, even just looking at your super fund, that you, they'll give you the top twenty holdings, which might be the top ten percent of of your money invested in there, and then there's two hundred and eighty other holdings that you've got no idea about. Um, and so, yeah, look, that's you know one of the key problems with the uh, the managed fund uh, model. And just finally, um, tax surprises. So when you're buying into a, a pooled fund of any sort, um, it's, they, you don't know what's going on from a tax perspective. There might be large capital gains or losses sitting in behind that fund, which will overall um, you know impinge on on the expected performance uh, going forward as well. That you, you really don't you know the opaqueness of it all is is it can make it quite difficult to know what you're buying into. Yeah. So. Yep. Absolutely. So what would you expect to pay? We touched on fees before. Um, 
look, as we mentioned, the, the, there's a you know, I mean, we've covered off with the exchange traded or the passive model, but um, the the fees here, look, they're very. Uh, I think they're they're quite averaged out if, if anything there's, there's certainly um people that sit on the on the outer realms of, of these but the you know the act the, always as usual the active piece is going to be more expensive than um than a passive or an, you know an indexed sort of model um and uh as you can see at the bottom there the uh and this is uh, I, I think we've we, we, we the ones that we covered on earlier were a lot cheaper well, there are certainly a lot, a lot, some that are a lot cheaper out there and yeah. and probably more expensive as well damien oh absolutely so so We've got there. There, the, you can buy some large cap international shares through a through an exchange traded fund and pay 0.44 as as the average for um, to get to get that as a and, that, and that's your exchange traded fund. Yep. So um, the S and P I think is 0.9 point, point zero 0.09, point Sorry. Zero, yep. Nine yeah. basis points. Whereas um, some of your emerging markets will be closer to one percent in terms of what you pay just for an index performance for those for those and um yeah and there'll be quite large spreads you might find on some of those as well in terms okay. of, of yeah yep sure thing um and, and i guess just finally we'll, we'll just quickly touch on um a structure that we use which what well, for, for mine actually just encompasses the best of both worlds both the direct share um or the self you know we were talking about the self-managed sort of um, benefits at the start there um with some of the oversight and the and the lack of or the 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 lesser need for uh, a client to to manage or oversee it on a daily basis, and we do this through a, a structure called a separately managed account. Um, and for our clients and for anybody who uses these, they've been around for about twenty years, but they've really started to gain popularity in what the last five, probably around you know around the same time Nicholas Wells started, perhaps. Yeah. No? <laughs> and most most large fundamental, um, most sorry, most large institutional investors, if they're investing with a a manager, will end up in some sort of managed account through through it because they it means that the tax is all isolated. In their own name they've got the transparency they want you know this is so to, to, to my mind this is the the way it's going you, you, hmm. your old unit trust pooled structure was from 50 years ago when it was really hard and everything had to be done on bits of paper and, and added up by hand whereas now that you know you don't have to and you can actually separate out people's individual tax liabilities and and, and give transparency that managed accounts make a lot more sense yep sure thing and, and look and that's one of the key things is that at the end of the day from a client perspective they've got their own discre discrete parcel of shares um, in our case um, international as well as Australian shares mm. um, they can see there they can you know to balance it out with cash and cash and bonds as well if it's a you know um, a multi-sector or multi-asset uh, portfolio but the idea is that um, the from a tax perspective you own all only your tax implications so when you buy in the capital gains is there um from from day dot when you join not when the the fund started essentially mm -hmm. um tax benefits being dividends and, and franking credits and distributions are all owned by yourself as as the ultimate holder of, of those individual um shares so um look for ours, and, I think and, we've, and we've, 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 well, no, we've, we've found, um, we've found this to be, I think, as I mentioned before, the, the best of both worlds, and it's a structure that we've, we've found. Probably the other thing as well, just finally, um, was the, the ability to make ongoing contributions over time. So, the beauty of, of separately managed accounts is that we can combine client or pull new incoming, for example, incoming money that's coming in, and we trade um, on a on a day that's called a book bill day, um, where we'll go to market once for each share essentially so what what that effectively does is mean that the clients that are in that in that book build will get um, dramatically reduced brokerage because it can be effectively divided by you know the number of clients to put to put broadly um, and then obviously any new money that's coming in is a fraction of the typical brokerage you'd normally pay because of this process mm. Cool. Okay, so look, uh, on that note, uh, if everything you've uh, enjoyed so far uh, it takes your interest or you'd like to know more about how to get some international exposure in your portfolio, stand by for some new information about Nucleus Wealth. Nucleus Wealth and the Macro Business Fund was put together to help give you access to quality, well-researched stock analysis and superior macroeconomically-minded asset allocation. We use technology to help us provide a service typically only available to high net worth and sophisticated investors at a fee level that rivals the more basic solutions available to these everyday investors. We do this by using separately managed accounts, which allows clients to enjoy unparalleled transparency in what they own and why. It also means that each client effectively owns their own separate and discrete share portfolio, which is managed by us. We have partnered with Linear Asset Management, who are backed by the ANZ Bank for Cash Management, 
and JP Morgan, one of the biggest banks in the world, as custodian of your assets. We feel that this structure is the gold standard for your financial protection. In addition to this, we offer 19 separate and individual ethical screens that you can use to help tailor your investment. To ensure that your money is not being used to support companies that deal in areas and practices that you feel are important. By eliminating the areas that are only important to you, you keep the potential for high returning areas that you might otherwise be ambivalent about. And these would typically be ruled out in broader ethical products currently available in the market. The name Nucleus comes from our ability to provide the core holdings of a client's portfolio, allowing them the time to explore areas that may be of interest or they may have experience in. We also offer a complete investment solution for those who don't have time to coordinate their own investments. Our investment team has decades of experience in world markets, and we have access to a global team of stock analysts. By removing the layers of middlemen that typically sit between your money and the markets, we've been able to reduce fees and provide unparalleled transparency in the solution we provide. For more information on what we can do for you, please call 1300 623 863 or contact us through www.nucleuswealth.com. Okay, so um, e welcome back, Andy. Uh, essentially, we're looking at, I'll just have a quick look at my notes. We've got uh, our next week, same bat time, same bat channel, Thursday, uh, the 6th of September at 12.30 p.m. We've got a special guest. So uh, Cameron Murray's coming along. So we've got Cameron, who is an economist and consultant. Uh, he specializes in property markets, environmental economics, and corruption. He's the co-author of a book called Game of Mates, which is a bit of a deep dive into um, some of the, the murky uh, underpinnings of the Australian political system and its corporate links. Um, and uh, so we welcome him. He's going to be down in Melbourne, so we're going to grab him for, for an hour or so. It's a pre-recorded one, that one, so we, uh, we won't be shooting that one live. We're actually heading to Sydney for the uh, Independent Financial Advisor Excellence Awards. We've been nominated for uh, Innovator of the Year as a company. Uh, so if you like, uh, stay tuned, hopefully, for some news on, on that one as well. As always, we are available on iTunes and wherever you get your reputable podcasts from on the Android platform. Uh, Podcast Addict is one that jumps to mind. Uh, you can head over to bit.ly forward slash Nucleus Insights. Um, and also, if you if you are listening in and you like uh, what you hear, please feel free to give us uh, some stars. Five would be nice. Uh, and also write a review as it helps uh, uh, lift our uh, our podcast up in the in the various channels and uh, and give us uh, more exposure. So that'd be greatly appreciated. And as always, thanks for attending. Uh, head, head on over to bit.ly forward slash nuclear survey if you'd like to give us a bit of feedback on how we've gone today. Uh, if you've got any additional questions as well, you can drop them in there and uh, also put up any uh, potential topics for future uh, webinars.